uh, intercept material, and that is by asking for an intersection capability. Now, um, the telephone company, the telecommunications uh, entity, that includes ISPs, already have that requirement they on them um, under Section 12 of the Regulation of the Investigative Powers Act. And the route that has been taken in the States is to go for that as well. And you've also heard, I think, from lots of suggestion that um, possibly this is the route that would be adopted here in the United Kingdom, that um, in addition to telcos, um, various service providers would be asked to provide an intercept capability as well. The problem, of course, is that most of the um, businesses that you're interested in are not based in the United Kingdom. So although the Parliament can pass a law, it won't actually be able to enforce it. And one of the great difficulties for those companies that are asked to cooperate is that um, they will have a series of financial and commercial problems if they get too involved in anything, particularly if uh, what they've been asked to do is uh, become involved in mass surveillance as opposed to targeted surveillance. So in fact, the only route that is open to um, the authorities that bypasses this problem, if you like, if it turns out to be a bypass, that is, is to try and monitor activity at the internet service provider and then bring uh, <coughs> out various forms of filtering. And the filtering is the real difficulty. And we heard a little bit about it before the break. I want to try and illustrate that to you a little bit more detail as we go along. This is uh, section 12 of the Regulation of the Investigative Powers Act, um, and it's the um, one that covers the, main, the current format, the maintenance of the intersection capability. Um, and I, as I just said uh, 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 30 seconds ago, um, this place is a real dilemma for the internet service provider. Um, they have got to actually follow the law strictly. Um, uh, I, I can't see any construction which would enable them to do anything otherwise. And um, here's a bit of ripple which um, allows them to intercept for the purpose of deciding whether something is intercept material or not. So let's look at a little bit more detail of the structure of the current law. But if you this at a very sort of high um, level, we'll be hearing, I think, probably from Dawi a little bit afterwards um, uh, in a little bit more detail. Essentially, content is any content in the course of travel. We're only talking about stuff that is traveling from one location to another. You've heard the warrants are issued by the Secretary of State. Um, you don't need a warrant if both parties consent, but not for this one, both of them got to um, uh, agree. And the peculiarity of English law that the result is inadmissible. Can't be used in evidence, can't even refer to it um, as though it might possibly have uh, happened, and that causes all sorts of difficulties. It's really sort of bizarre to be sitting in a, uh, in a trial, a terrorist trial, when you know there's been all sorts of complex audio and video surveillance, which is invisible, and everyone has to pretend that um, there's been no type of intercept going on at all. That's how we do things. It's probably no longer sustainable, incidentally. And what is communications data? It's a record that communications occur. It refers to the participants, time, duration, and it has some technical data. Um, so here, very, very quickly, the bits of law refer to it. Um, section 1 of RIPA, which covers um, interception. And section 17, which is the exclusion of matters from legal proceedings. Um, 20, section 21 is the definition or the current definition of what communication state is. I'm not going to try and take you through it through stage by stage, but um, this is the area that you need to look at. And if you're going to have reform of the law, it's particularly section 6 and 7 that would need to get altered and scrutinised very, very carefully. And the other bit of law which you've heard about is the data retention um, uh, EC directive regulations. You've heard that we have actually had data retention in this country since 2001. But just to complete this, that's what it looks like. So, how does it work out? Um, these ideas first emerged in the Deceptive Communications Act of 1985, and then it was all very, very easy. Um, the traditional phone call, what's the communication data? It's the detailed phone bill. Um, what's the content? You place an audio recorder across the line. Clear technical separation, no real difficulty about defining it. 
uh, the mobile phones, um, we get a little bit more information, um, we have a hardware identity and a SIM, um, and we have a cell site location. And this has been one of the most important sources of new investigations. Well, not no longer that new, the most important um, investigation tools for a huge range of, uh, of inquiries. And often when um, politicians and others make sweeping generalizations about the value of um, communications data, this is very often what they're thinking about. Let's move over to the internet. As we know, it's all packets, and you need to look at it to see what is happening. Now, this next bit is going to be a little bit glib. Um, those of you who are uber geeks are going to sort of wince and say, oh, he's sort of um, uh, not giving us all the detail. Yes, I know, but I'm also trying to keep it sort of very simple. And I'm also conscious that the main aim of this exercise is to help people who are not geeks at all realize that actually the principles aren't all that difficult. Essentially, what goes on in the data packet, where it's got the address of the originator who sent it, or the computer who sent it, it's got the address of the computer that's supposed to receive it, it's got the data that's actually being transmitted, the thing that's being transmitted, except that includes both the content and the communications elements, and there's some supervisory information. You know, as you probably know, um, uh, on the internet, um, packets might arrive at the same destination through different directions, but they may not necessarily arrive in order, so you need some supervisory data so that they get reassembled. You also need some error correction. That's basically what we find inside there. <laughs> So in order to separate out your data and your content, what you need is something called deep packet inspection. And it's um, a lot less magical and complex than people think. It's complex in the detail, it's not complex in principle. This is software implementation of it. Um, it's a package that um, you, know, you can freely download and install on your own computer, currently called Wireshark. It's a slightly old sort of screen print, it used to be called Ethereum. But what you can see there is uh, the packets um, uh, analyzed uh, as they go by. Um, the first line, one can see in dark blue if you're interested, is simply a sort of a local area sort of message. And it's trying to find out uh, which computers are still connected to the uh, network. But the rest of it is simply a request from one computer on that local network to uh, have the BBC News website presented on it. And um, you can analyze that in a great deal of detail. That's the whole point about these things. There are lots and lots of filters that you can apply in order to get hold of the information. But the package is the software, and when you implement it in hardware, you have to for uh, large volume material, they don't actually do any of that for you automatically. Um, you have to write the filters. And um, that is really where all the expense came along. I think you've heard a little bit about that in the session that we had before. There are some situations in which this is actually very easy. It's very easy in conventional email. Um, email has to work to a particular standard. Um, go work for standard and hold the standard and then just receive we can't send email. And um, these are the particular standards that are being used. And you probably know if you use a conventional uh, email program, that's what you normally see. And you possibly know that if you get the right sort of menu item, you can also see these supervisory headers which get sent along the same way, same time. And I um, apologize for the horrible detail on this particular screen, but um, uh, there you can see what the headers look like line by line. And you'll see that um, each line has got a label. That label is always consistent because it is referred to in the standard. And that makes it extremely easy for a computer program to go through and say, these are bits that we are going to need as um, uh, communications data, these bits of content, and these don't interest. <coughs> and I'm flagging those up with these um, uh, various sort of arrows. The blue arrows are uh, if you like the comm data more or less, uh, who sent it at what time, time zone, that sort of thing. And the red stuff is the subject and um, the actual content of the message. So that's jolly easy. So um, your uh, magic box can make that separation very, very easy. And it's one of the very few situations where we can. Let's look at how that applies on the World Wide Web. I think Ross spoke a little bit about this, and I wanted to um, uh, give you a few um, graphics um, uh, to try to round the message home. Um, strictly speaking, comm statement, the fact that the user sent a command to a remote website, web server, everything else is content. 
So there are some discussions about how you interpret that in terms of how a web location for URL is actually going to work. And some people say um, it's only up to the first backslash. So what you can see there is um, bbc.co.uk backslash stop. Um, if you've got slash new slash technology, um, then um, that is context. There's another interpretation which says, well, um, maybe you can refer to file names, but not the file contents, in which case you would get all more information. That included the second example, not only the fact that you went to an NSE website, but that you were interested in finding your way around the NSE. Um, <coughs> now, then, if you do that, um, there, then there's a rather interesting um, result. Have a look at the second line I've got there. This is how the independence um, uh, uh, runs their website. And on the whole, new stories get um, names, file names, which are associated with the content of the message. So you don't see the content, but you do get the file names. So on that basis, you have some idea of what people have been looking at with the independence. If you go to the Economist website, um, nothing sinister about it. They just use a series of numbers. So that isn't, from an investigative point of view, um, terribly helpful. Let's look at um, this next thing, which is what you would see in a Google, after in, a, in, a, in the top of your browser after you've completed a Google search. Is this actually a file? I think it may not be, because what you actually see there is a command generated by your browser going up to Google and say, get us some information on the intersection modernization program uh, presented in the English language. Oh, by the way, my browser is Firefox. That's basically what that is saying. That's probably not a file. Um, that's a command. So that is possibly content. Now, I'm not asking you to agree with me or disagree with me, other than to say, we have some confusion here. And another thing I want to draw to your attention, beginning of the Google um, uh, URL, you'll see that phrase HTTPS. That means it's an encrypted page. And I'll come on to that a little bit later on. It does mean it can't actually be scrutinized by any DPI um, or not um, without a great deal of difficulty. So let's now look quickly at web mail. We looked at conventional mail, but this is the sort of mail, as you know, where you actually have everything operated on a website. And this particular version is what you would be getting if you were a customer of um, uh, BT Internet. This, um, a few days ago, was my junk mail folder. I don't actually use the service, but um, I can't mind if I was full of, uh, full of junk mail. And you can look at this sort of um, fairly quickly. You say, oh, well, um, actually, it's not all that difficult. You can separate out the content um, from the um, communications data. This is obviously content. Um, this is date, and this is who sent things, um, sent things along. Um, so actually, Sure, we can um, uh, slightly alter the uh, law of the land and we will get access to it. Well, maybe you can, but what you're lacking is those easy little labels which uh, we saw on the conventional email and which will help you understand uh, or help the computer program understand what it can look at and what it can't. If you look behind the page, what you've got is HTML. Um, hypertext markup language, and actually there are several different ways in which you can create that page in HTML that look exactly the same. So there's no standard, no several ways in which you can do it. There is a route, um, and you use something called web scraping software, and that's um, stuff that is used by those price comparison uh, sites. You know, you were interested in uh, buying um, uh, the washing machine of your dreams, and you want to um, find out who's offering the best price. <laughs> and um, you'll see what Comet and Argos and everybody else is offering. They use web scraping software to go to the original site and keep the data on it. Um, trouble with it is, it's just a tool. You want to define how it works. So each page that you're interested in, you've got to um, tell the program, this is the stuff that we want. And the point I'm making to you is, this has not been done over and over and over again for every page where you think there might be comms data which you want to extract. But I hope you're getting some idea of the difficulty of the task that is facing um, this sort of magic DPI box. 
that we go. And of course, it doesn't work if um, uh, pages are encrypted. And there are further problems. OK, this is what BT's web mail looks like now. This is how they're changing it as we speak. Um, and that's a feature of how of uh, what goes on with a lot of these services periodically um, for reasons of their own. The design has changed, and the design has changed, and you've got to change the web scraping uh, software which you might need in your DPI um, package. And you have to do again some separately for Gmail. Oh, Gmail is changing itself as well. And another thing here for um, one and one, which is a German, uh, a German service, um, and so on and so forth. And notice, actually, all of these things are encrypted, so you probably wouldn't be able to do it anyway. Um, so I hope that we can get a picture not only of the complexity of the problem, but also that we still have missed an awful lot of stuff. But we face the danger that we have to spend lots and lots of money. Um, and it's not going to produce anything that's worthwhile. I'm going to go very quickly through some other examples. Um, bulletin boards for exactly the same sort of problem. Um, <coughs> these are things that service small businesses. You can see that they have lots of different visual styles. All of them, each one of them is going to have to have um, another series of um, filters, white written for them specifically. Um, you can set up bulletin boards very, very easily. This one will host everything for you and not charge you either, unless you want some special services. Um, instant messaging, again, um, there are lots and lots of different services. The experience may be very similar, but the underlying protocols aren't. So again, your clever package is going to have to, um, on, 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 your, on, on your DPI box, is going to have to understand all of these things and also cope with them as they change over time. And there are lots and lots of these services. Um, detailed examination of various protocols. Social media. Social media are actually conglomerations of lots of different services um, together. And again, you have to do the legal analysis to say which bits you call the comms data and which are content, and then apply that to the technical protocols. Oh, and by the way, those of these services, Facebook included, are encrypted anyway, so your web scraping software, so it goes to your DPI block, doesn't going to work anyway. And there are lots and lots of these services, um, and they come and they go. Um, so you're going to have to keep up with this thing. So your cost in maintaining this facility, not in the hardware, is a huge ongoing cost in building up these filters, whether it is done by the supplier, whether it is done, whether it's done by the ISP, or whether it's done by GCHQ. It all has to be paid for. Similar problems with voice over internet protocol. Um, there are actually several different types of protocols for voice over internet um, telephony. Again, if you can get those people to provide you with an interception capability, then you have access. Otherwise, you've got to figure it all out. You get your DPI box to do it. Um, you have a huge ongoing technical problem. And the same applies to my last example, which are apps and widgets which you get on your mobile phone. Um, these are just miniature programs. They've all got comms facilities, and they use different types of protocols to go through that. And you all know how many different apps there are there as well. Um, some pretty pictures there, for those of you who don't know what an app looks like. <laughs> and coming up in the uh, not too distant future, internet connected games, consoles, smart televisions, they have these sort of facilities as well. And I think the other element which should, be, which should give us a lot of concerns, taxpayers, those my theme is not on um, uh, civil rights or these other things, which I do care about, it's just the sheer, you know, open-ended cost of the whole thing. These are lots of simple routes, um, most of them requiring no technical skill, simply an awareness that they exist, which makes it extremely easy to evade um, any of the surveillance that's going to be done at an ISP level. So what are we looking for in terms of tests for success of the proposed legislation? You're going to need an easily interpreted definition of what comms data is. 
It's got to be easily technically deployed, and cost has got to um, offer value for money. Um, don't forget, there are lots of other ways of um, fighting these things, and if you spend a lot of money on, this, on black boxes, but you haven't got that money for rather more conventional uh, types of inquiry, like um, surveillance offices on the ground, um, intelligence analysts looking at material, trying to draw proper conclusions. One of the big concerns I have is that this is going to go through um, uh, as um, something that isn't properly scrutinised by Parliament and <coughs> um, by previous speakers. So we have a total secrecy because of international security, we can't talk about it in the open. Um, uh, people are going to do the usual rubbish of commercial confidentiality of contract, and you'll have the other um, uh, delicious elements in uh, what goes wrong with uh, government projects, a lack of clarity of what we're trying to do, sign the contract, um, and then you decide afterwards what you want the thing to do. You go along to your supplier and they say, oh, let's go to the annex and that'll tell you what your run on costs are. This is the recipe <coughs> for um, costs going desperately out of control, and this has got all the signs that this is going to go uh, this particular way. Um, I am I'm running out of my time. I had intended to talk about what future legislation might look like. I got those on the slide um, because I always get irritated when people go over their stop when I'm sort of down the line and stop at this particular point. If anyone is interested um, in that or we have time, I will talk to you about what the um, uh, a new legislative framework would um, look like. But I can just spend one minute telling you what the characteristics are. You have to abandon the notion that you can split content from content. This doesn't get works any longer. You, this needs to be targeted and not whole population. Um, everyone has said they want judicial um, oversight. And um, uh, one of the other implications of this is that we have to get rid of this ridiculous uh, notion that somehow of all the various types of technical evidence that are available, um, intercept evidence is um, uniquely um, uh, special and needs to be preserved um, in its sort of secret, uh, under a cloud of secrecy. I and lots of other people in this room have actually used intercept evidence um, uh, when we've done cases um, either overseas or there's been overseas intercept material there. Actually, it's very difficult to done properly. It's very robust and very difficult to challenge. Um, I was supposed to finish at half past five until 29 minutes, but I've got up already.